Good afternoon. It gives me great pleasure to share this very special event with you, this special lecture, Globalization and Geopolitics in the Digital Era, that will be delivered by President Fernandez, my good friend. My name is Jorge Heine, and I direct the Partiz Center for the Study of the Longer Range Future at the Partiz School of Global Studies. In today's troubled world, we at the Partiz Center try to bring leading voices from the rest of the world to the BU community. And we regard as one of our primordial duties to do that. Uh, we here at the Partiz School aim to train our students to fix the world. But to fix the world, we need to understand it. And for that, we need voices from all over the world to do that. This semester, we have been lucky enough to have had the former foreign minister of Mexico, Jorge Castañeda, and the leading analyst and public intellectual. Shortly thereafter, we had Victor Gao, the former translator of Deng Xiaoping in China, who came all the way from Beijing. And today, we have President Manuel Fernandez to share his views about the world with us. Um, President Fernandez belongs in that uh, rare and very special category that we really don't see that much in other continents. And that is something we have in Latin America, and that is the scholar statesman. That is, distinguished university professors who devote their life not just to improving uh, the state of our intellect, but also to lead our nations towards a better destiny. In Latin America, we thus have Fernando Enrique Cardoso in Brazil, Ricardo Lagos in Chile, Ernesto Cedillo in Mexico, all presidents who were not just great intellectuals, but also remarkable statesmen. And President Fernandez, three-time president of the Dominican Republic, has an impressive record of accomplishment in that regard in his 12 years in office in various moments in the recent past. And I always like to insist, I, I started my career in academia, in Caribbean studies, living for many years in Puerto Rico, and uh, imbibing what is known as La Magie Antilles. And uh, in the Caribbean, in the past few decades, there are a few success stories, like the one of the Dominican Republic. From 2010 to 2018, the Dominican Republic had the highest growth, not just in the Caribbean, but in Latin America, 5.8%, as opposed to 2% for the rest of Latin America. Today, the Dominican Republic is the biggest economy in the Caribbean and in Central America. It has managed to make the transition from agriculture and manufacturing towards the service sector. Today, 22% of the Dominican Republic's GDP comes from tourism. Uh, amazingly, these are the sort of little indicators that I tell my students they should watch for, was the one country in the world in 2022 that had more visitors, more international visitors, than in 2019. Uh, you need to know what you are doing to be able to have those kinds of uh, results. Uh, Dominican Republic has somewhere between 7 and 8 million international visitors every year. One out of every four tourists that go to the Caribbean go to the Dominican Republic. As a result of that, the per capita income in the Dominican Republic is, has soared. It is today higher than it is in Mexico or in uh, Brazil, and President Fernandez has played a very important role in achieving that. But in addition to his accomplishment as a statement, and he just gave me a copy of one of his recent books, uh, he is a well-known public intellectual. He has written many books. He has taught at various universities. He has his own foundation. Nothing like running the old shop, he says, Funglode, which puts together a major conference every year in New York, I've been lucky to attend two of them. He tells me he hosts another conference in Casa de Campo. 
I have not in, been invited to that one yet, <laughs> but it's I coming. hope now that he has been here, perhaps I'll get uh, an opportunity uh, to do so. Uh, President Fernandez has received uh, honorary doctorates from 10 universities from uh, around the world, including one here from University of Massachusetts here in town, as well as from uh, La Sorbonne. He will speak today on a topic that is very much in keeping with his concerns I would argue that part of his success is that he has always been very future-oriented, picking up global trends that he can channel into the benefit of the Dominican Republic and of his people. And today he will speak about uh, the state of globalization and geopolitics, this very terrible and uh, complex uh, competition that we see today between the great powers and uh, the digital era. He was just mentioning uh, to me and to Professor Eckstein how he's so keen to bring the teaching of AI to uh, Dominican schools. That is what makes a real visionary statement. President Fernandez. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Ambassador Jorge Heinde, my very good friend, for such a warm and kind introduction. Thanks to you all for being here today. I truly appreciate it. Uh, dear friends, uh, Dominicans that live here in Boston, and many other friends that even came from the Dominican Republic, it's really an honor and a pleasure to be here today. Uh, Ambassador Heinde was talking a little bit about Dominican Republic, its accomplishments, over the last few decades, but I must say that here in Boston, Dominican Republic is better known as baseball land. And it's because Dominicans made possible overcome the baby, the Ruth uh, curse, that the Red Sox would not win a pennant once again until the Dominicans came in. Pedro Martinez and David Ortiz and Manny Ramirez. So we, we're a baseball land, we're not a uh, military superpower. We're not an economic superpower, we are a baseball superpower. That's who we are. That's Dominicans. Well, if uh, I were speaking uh, politically to an electorate audience back in the Dominican Republic, most likely I would deliver a speech. But being in an academic setting, I want to share with you more a PowerPoint presentation about uh, globalization and about current geopolitics around the world in the digital era. So if you allow me, that's what I'm going to do. Uh, I have a lot of slides here. I'll go by them very quickly, so we'll have a chance for Q&A at the end. Is that, is that okay with you? All right. So it's globalization and geopolitics in, in uh, the digital era. And the first question we ask is, what is globalization all about? And of course, there is no consensus about it. People see it in a different perspective. But I would say that globalization basically is a process it's a process of integration and interdependence among nations, right? And this integration and interdependence has many dimensions. It can be economic globalization, it can be political globalization, cultural globalization, etc. It has different dimensions, but at the end, it just means that we are integrating, we are becoming interdependent among different nation states. Uh, now, the question is, when this globalization began? To some people, it began even before uh, the discovery of America or their coming in, into different cultures. But we tend to consider more modern globalization. And modern globalization will go, I consider, it, into three stages. The first stage would be the second industrial revolution at the end of the 19th century. And it became possible for two major reasons, which is what uh, identifies globalization. A, a revolution in communication systems and a revolution in transportation. And we can see that in the second industrial revolution from 1870 to 1914. Railroad networks, transportation, radio communication systems, television and film industry for the first time. That was a major transformation. But then, at the end of the First World War, 
uh, there was a stalemate within globalization, and that's why we call it interwar protectionism. That didn't last too much because we all know that the Great Depression came at the end of the 20s and took the whole 30s until Franklin Delano Roosevelt came into office in 1933. <clears throat> and with Franklin Delano Roosevelt, uh, the New Deal policies were put in, in place. And these New Deal policies basically uh, were characterized by regulations, the implementation of regulations in different government agencies. So there will be banking regulations. Before that, banks were unregulated. Or there would be uh, social policies like uh, healthcare systems, Medicaid, Medicare, etc. Or you would have uh, unemployment uh, benefits or uh, laws that would allow banks to repay in case of bankruptcy to those depositors. So all those measures were taken during FDR's administration, and they're called the New Deal uh, policies, no? And because of that, because of these New Deal policies, once again, the American economy was able to recover, overcoming the Depression years. Now, those policies continued in place after World War II, and there was an economic expansion between 1944, the, at the end of World War II, up to the 70s. Continuous expansion. Economy was always growing over 4%, but many uh, products and services came to the market for the first time. Refrigerators, vehicles, television sets, radios, etc. Uh, was able to uh, be part of American households in the after war, after World War II. The American dream was, was all about that, about having a house, about having a car, about having access to uh, uh, modern appliances. So we can say that th during all almost 40 years, the American economy, the US economy, but also in Europe, where social Democrats were in power, economy was doing great, and, and people were improving their quality of lives. But then in the 70s, something happened. Uh, all of a sudden, the economy went in a, in, a down, in a downturn. And the reason was, first of all, uh, you had budgetary deficits. There was fiscal constraints because of the Vietnam War. Uh, there was oil shocks, 1973 oil shock, where prices of oil quadrupled. That was 1973. Once again in 1979, with, uh, with the occurrence of the Iranian Revolution, 1979, Ayatollah Khomeini came into office, and then there was a second oil shock. And all these elements will require a transformation of the economic paradigm that had been implemented since the post-war, and that Republicans or Democrats used in the US following Keynesian uh, theories. No? But now, uh, with uh, I would say with the ending of this expensive economic system, and, and now with stagflation and all this taking place, a new theoretical paradigm was being put in place, the neoliberalism paradigm, right? And through the neoli neoliberalism paradigm came the Washington Consensus. And it was a reverse of everything that had to do with the New Deal and everything that FDR did. So the economy became deregulated. Uh, banking system was deregulated. The airlines, the railroads, transportation system, they were all deregulated. They were privatized. State-owned companies became privatized. And so there's a whole set of, of uh, ideas and policies that were implemented totally contrary of what was being implemented by the Keynesian theory or the uh, New Deal. And uh, with it, at the same time, uh, beginning of the 1980s, we had political democratization going on around the world. Uh, a professor from Harvard, Samuel Huntington, called it the third wave. And the reason this happened is, first I would say, uh, in Greece, the military were, were overtaken by a civil government. There was a revolution in Greece at the end the mid-1970s, the, the uh, Francisco Franco regime also ended because of the death of Francisco Franco, and then uh, a kingdom was brought back into place. But there was a transition to democracy in Spain at the time, and also in Portugal. There was a revolution in Portugal where the Salazar family was taken down, and there was, a, uh, I would say, a, a transition to democracy in all these places. So Greece, Spain, and Portugal Southern Europe were in a process of making a transition to democracy. Now, 
Many Latin American leaders, leaders from Brazil, leaders from Chile, from Argentina, that were in exile because of the dictatorships that were having at the time, since the beginning of the 70s, a new wave of dictatorships in Latin America, not Trujillo or Batista, these were the old dictators of the 1940s, 1950s. The 1970s, Pinochet in Chile, Jorge Videla in Argentina, the, the guerrillas as they call it in Brazil. So all these political leaders had to migrate. <coughs> Many came to Europe. And they learned that the, uh, the, the nature of the struggle in Latin America was no more between capitalism versus socialism, but it was more authoritarianism versus democracy. And by this example, they were able to rethink policy back in Latin America and initiate a new chapter in Latin American history of moving towards democracy. So this was part of the, of the third wave. Of course, we have to give credit to President Jimmy Carter at the time. Jimmy Carter was the one that brought in a human rights policy and the need for electoral transparency in Latin America. So the U.S. government was not going to recognize any government that did not come out of the polls, representing the people's will, expressing the polls. This was Jimmy Carter, sometimes underrated, but I think this made a tremendous a tremendous impact in the nature of political systems back in, in Latin America and in many other places around the world. In addition to that is what the international socialist, which is the social democracy in, in Europe, uh, opened its doors for political parties in the third world, especially in Latin America and in Africa. And so traditional populist parties in Latin America were able to be part of the international socialists, the social democracy, the European social democracy. And with the help of Francois Mitterrand from France, from Willy Brandt in Germany, they, pr they exercised pressure to many of the authoritarian governments in Latin America at the time, so that uh, the, ex the uh, voting uh, of the people at the polls should be respected. And that's the way we made it. We began a new chapter just 40 years ago of democratic transition in Latin America. So it's the combination of all these factors. The fall of the uh, Portuguese uh, dictatorship, also in Greece, the death of Francisco Franco in Spain, the international socialist, uh, Jimmy Carter's uh, human rights policy, the experience by many Latin American leaders in Europe, all this came back together in Latin America and began a new chapter of democracy. For the first time uh, in Latin American history, we, we've never had a period of 40 years of continuous democracy in Latin America. It's the first time in our history that we do have that. But then, uh, coinciding with uh, this third wave of democratization, we come to the end of the Cold War. That's the other side. Began with the fall of the Berlin Wall, as we all know, in 1989. This revolution began in 1989. And then, after the Berlin Wall, we had the, uh, the fall of the Eastern Bloc, Hungary, uh, Czechoslovakia, uh, all the Eastern Bloc countries, popular democracies as they were called, all these countries also, their socialist governments fell as part of the wave that was taking place, the collapse of the Eastern Bloc, and then finally, of course, is the dissolution of the Soviet Union that took place in 1991, under Mikhail Gorbachev's leadership. He was talking about perestroika and glasnost, and that meant reform in, in, in the then United, United Republic of Socialist Soviets, Soviet Socialist Republics, La Union Sovietica, Soviet Union, right? And with the fall of the Soviet Union, with the dissolution, 15 different countries were, were created. 15 independent nations were created on the uh, what used to be the Soviet Union. Now, this is a new chapter in history. The dissolution of the Soviet Union, the end of communism, means a new chapter in history. And now the question is, is there a new, a new world order? President Bush talked about, Bush Sr. talked about a new world order after the Gulf War, after uh, Saddam Hussein was driven out of Kuwait when he uh, occupied Kuwait back in 1991. Uh, giving origin to the Gulf War. He talked about a new world order. But really the new world order would have begun with the dissolution of the Soviet Union in 1991. What happens after the dissolution? We call it major trends taking place. Trends in ideology, in what would be called hyper-globalization, the digital revolution, 
global terrorism, global financial crisis, and COVID-19. I think these six elements have been the defining moments uh, since the dissolution of the Soviet Union. The New World Order, I think there was an attempt to define that by, once again, uh, Professor uh, Samuel Huntington with his book, The Clash of Civilizations, in which he said a new era of international relations began. There is going to be, he, he uh, was portraying the idea that there was, was going to be a weakening of the West and a rising of the rest. And the rising of the rest will be other civilizations, not only Western civilization, but other civilizations that will compete with the West, with the West, and at some point even overcome the West, especially Asia and China. But also the clash with, with Islam. He also made the point that the new world system would mean also a clash between the West and Islam as a political representation of some Arab worlds. Uh, at the same time, confrontation within the Islamic world itself. So the whole idea that the future world system would be a class of cultures, a class of civilization, with a decline of the West and a rise of the East, and that there will be a power shift from the West to the East was more or less the point of view that he held in a class of civilizations. Then we have also Francis Fukuyama. Francis Fukuyama, who was a researcher at Rand Corporation, his idea was, taking his philosophical ideas from Hegel and Alexander Kozhelev, a French philosopher who was a student of Hegel's philosophy, he said that humanity has reached a stage with uh, democracy and market system as the latest stage of progress in human nature. So his idea was that democracy and a market system is the last stage of human progress and that we have reached that with the dissolution of the Soviet Union and the beginning of, of this new chapter of creating uh, a world system, a new world system. And of course, with the dissolution of the Soviet Union, the United States became the only superpower, and it's called the unipolar moment. And this unipolar moment was exactly 1991 with the dissolution of the US until September 11, 2001, where we have global terrorism being impacting the three main symbols of power in the US, financial, political, and military, the Pentagon, the uh, Twin Towers, and another plane expected to hit either the White House or the Capitol. Uh, so it was, it was an expression that a new era had begun. We always had terrorism, but this was a different type of terrorism. It was global terrorism coming from the caves of Afghanistan to hit the major symbols of power, world power, in the US, financial, military, and political. But then, in addition to global terrorism, right, uh, we have hyperglobalization. We talked about two stages previously, from 1870 to 1914, first stage, second industrial revolution, and then the New Deal from 1944 to the 1970s. Now, in the 90s, we have a third stage of globalization, which is hyperglobalization, as it was called by Professor Danny Roderick, professor from Harvard, who wrote the, uh, this book, The Globalization Paradox. And the whole idea that it is a hyperglobalization is because there are, have been dramatic changes in the size, scope, and velocity of globalization that began in, in the late 1990s, right? So it's unlimited economic integration beyond national boundaries. And what do we mean by unlimited integration that all national uh, norms, all national regulations, all national standards will be overtaken by multinational corporations that will begin operating in those countries? So any norm, any, any law, any regulation that would exist, let's say, in the Dominican Republic, and a multinational corporation would commend those norms, those regulations would not exist for this uh, multinational corporation that would be coming in. So it's hyper-globalization, hyper right? And, and of course, this will generate a conflict between the workings of the nation state and the free flow of economic globalization. Some authors would say that hyper-globalization will abolish nation states, that any social relationship must be done on a global scale and that the nation state will disappear. This has not happened. What was needed was to strengthen 
national states to really govern globalization. It will be the other way around, what was needed. But at the time, it was signaled that nation states will weaken, eventually disappear, and that there will be, uh, I would say, a global governance that has not taken place to generate the regulation needed for globalization. Globalization brings us to global issues, things that are of common interest to everybody around the world. Population growth, we're going now to over to reach 8 billion people in the planet. Uh, it's growing exponentially, even though by the second half of the 21st century is going to peak and then come down. So, but 8 billion in the planet is a lot of pressure we're going to have. Food security is another major issue, another major global issue. International migration, climate change, energy, the needs to change traditional energy dependent on fossil fuels to more renewable energy systems, water, solar systems. You know? uh, the cyber crime is, is a new type of challenge that we're having in the 21st century. Diseases, pandemics, etc. COVID-19 is the most recent example. And of course, some, that's something that has not been uh, yet uh, tackled with correctly, which is uh, nuclear proliferation. Because of this hyper-globalization, there has been a reaction, and the reaction is anti-globalization. In anti-globalization, we have left-wing, left-wing movements and left-wing parties that are anti-globalization, and basically they, they uh, signal their opposition to globalization because it, it is neoliberal globalization. They're against neoliberal globalization. So Fidel Castro, Hugo Chavez, will always speak about the anti-globalization, but from this perspective. We're not going to privatize, we're not going to deregulate, uh, we're not going to lower our tariffs, our, uh, our tariffs. Uh, we're not going to take those measures because there is an asymmetrical relationship between developed countries and underdeveloped. Right? If we open up our markets, considering we are on an equal footing, it's wrong. And I'll just give you an example that we know very well in the Dominican Republic. Haiti uh, used to produce rice. So all the rice they consumed was produced in Haiti. But because of free trade, Haiti began importing rice from Arkansas in the United States. Now the rice produced in Arkansas is subsidized by the US federal government in its production and its exports. So when this rice was imported to Haiti, it was cheaper, it was better, so consumers would benefit, but it would harm the producers. So Haiti doesn't produce rice anymore. Uh, Haitian workers would go to the Dominican Republic to produce rice in the Dominican Republic, but they have to import rice into Haiti. And this is what they were talking about, the asymmetrical, unequal relationship between a developed country and underdeveloped. One who receives subsidies, the other that does not. So it was cheaper, it was better, it was more accessible to the consumer, but it harmed the producers, and of course it harmed wealth production in the case of Haiti. So this is the, uh, the rhetoric coming from the narrative from the left wing, why they oppose globalization. But there is also a right wing uh, narrative of why there is opposition to globalization. And this is basically the relocation of manufacturing and industry. So industries abandoned the United States and they went to China, basically. So many of the workers here in the U.S., they lost their jobs. Manufacturing jobs were lost because there was the idea that you have 1,400,000,000 potential consumers, Chinese consumers of U.S. products. If our U.S. companies go to China, it's a huge market, but it was not considered that by leaving manufacturing jobs going to China was going to create unemployment with the blue-collar workers here in the U.S., uh, so some developing countries, as China, they have gained at the expense of developed countries like the U.S. And the idea was, if we take those, if we relocate U.S. companies to China, and many did, and still many are there, right, they will benefit, but at the same time did not calculate that it was going to harm uh, manufacturing jobs here in the United States. And this created then uh, a political movement and an economic movement, which is protectionism, right? and it is populism. 
And who incarnates that is better is Donald Trump. When he comes into office, he's going to increase tariffs uh, for the imports of goods coming from China. Right? That's the reaction. The reaction is we're going to establish limits to this relationship. So uh, we have a left-wing motivation and a right-wing motivation to go against globalization. Another element then major trend in the post uh, in the post uh, Cold War is digital revolution because you cannot have hyper globalization without a revolution in communication technologies, transportation and communication, and of course the digital revolution has been extraordinary as nothing has happened before in human history. Information and communication technologies, biotechnology, robotics, artificial intelligence, nanotechnology, big data in cybersecurity. We can go on each one of them, but, but we know that each one of them will be a specific lecture. These are the main topics within the digital revolution that still uh, is impacting us. We talked about global terrorism already, the September 11, groups like Al-Qaeda, ISIS or Daesh, as they're called in the Middle East, Boko Haram in Africa, as well as Al-Shabaab uh, in the case of Ethiopia or Somalia, uh, most likely. The U.S. responded to global terrorism, U.S.-led invasion of Afghanistan in 2011, and to Iraq. Everybody uh, agrees that it was necessary for the U.S. to hit Afghanistan because the terrorism came from there. But there's always a debate if there was a need to attack Iraq because Iraq was not directly involved in the attacks to the uh, Twin Towers. So. The uh, invasion to Iraq was one of a choice, not of a need, as many have indicated. The next element is the global financial crisis, 2008. I think this changed everything in the world. There was a lot of trust in the U.S. financial system. No one could have expected that coming through a real estate bubble situation, the whole banking system around the world was going to be, uh, was going to be uh, impacted as it did, right? Now... This global financial crisis was the result of the deregulation of the financial system, that's one, and the financial institutions would play different roles. Commercial banks would become investment banks. You would have new institutions like hedge funds, mutual funds, etc. You will have new uh, financial products, like for example, futures trading in stock exchange, uh, where you will s you will buy futures contracts on commodities, contributing to increase the price of those commodities. I'll, I'll let me just give you an example. This is something that I experienced when I was in office. Uh, in the Dominican Republic, we import oil. So we depend very much on oil. If one day oil increased $25 a barrel, you would ask yourself, is there a war in the Middle East? What has happened so that oil increased $125 a barrel in one day? Uh, it came up to a point in 2008 that a barrel of oil cost $150. When I left office in the year 2000, oil was $15 a barrel. $15 a barrel. Seven years later, it was $150 a barrel. What happened? Many wars in the, in the Middle East? No. It was because futures contracts, uh, investment banks, will uh, manage the uh, pension funds from the police of New York. They will use those resources to invest in the stock exchange and they will buy futures contracts, oil futures contracts. If you buy millions of those contracts, they'll have an impact on the real price of oil. So it was, as you will say, uh, financial speculation put in the global market that altered the whole situation around the world with the increase of oil prices. So everything was working like that. There was a situation with commodities, commodities markets superficially, artificially being bought by huge amounts of contracts using pension funds or wealth sovereign funds through the investment banks in creating these price increases. So that was the reason why you know, one day you'll see that oil prices jumped $25 uh, with no real reason in the physical markets. So the global financial crisis created all that. With the bankruptcy of the banks, there was 
a downfall right, in, in, in economic growth. There was a contraction. A global recession took place because of the, cri of the banking crisis. Now, when there is a recession, as it happened with Franklin Delano Roosevelt in the New Deal period, if you're in office and you find there is a recession, what do presidents do? They call the president of the central bank and they agree, central government and central bank, they agree on one specific issue. In order to come out of a recession, you have to expand monetary policies. You have to put more money in the markets. And that's what happened around the world. Specifically here in the US, during President Obama's term, to contain the global recession, Obama created what is called quantitative easing. That was expanding uh, the amount of money put in the market to make the US economy rebound. And it did. But at the same time, it was continued from 2008 until 2020. During all those years, the quantitative easing policy was still in place. So the US economy was pumping in money continuously. When the COVID-19 COVID came in 2020, and there was another contraction of the economy, and you had to put in place nine trillion US dollars, you had something that you did not expect, high inflation. First real inflation in 40 years. So the same expansionary monetary policy that came with the uh, financial crisis in 2008 was repeated to rebound the economy after COVID, and it created the inflation that we're still going through, and that now is being combated by the Federal Reserve increasing interest rates. So you increase interest rates, you lower inflation, but at the same time, the economy becomes sluggish. The economy is not growing as it should be. And then, because of the global financial crisis, you had a political crisis, Occupy Wall Street, protests in Europe, 5M in Spain, Arab Spring, protests in Latin America, and populism. All this was the consequence of the global financial crisis. Europe, austerity measures. In Europe, it was the contrary what they did here in the US or elsewhere. Within a recession, they made a huge mistake. They did not apply expansionary monetary policy, austerity measures, and that created a political crisis because within a recession, if you cut the budget in education and in healthcare, whatever, people will get angry, take the streets and protest and have political instability. So now we get to the pandemic and the pandemic was not only a disease in terms of healthcare, but it was also a catastrophe in, in economic terms because there was a huge drop in terms of economic growth. And as, as I've just said, the only way that you can overcome that is by pumping more money into the market, but that creates inflation. And to bring it down, then you have to increase interest rates and that slows the economy. So you are in a terrible dilemma. Either you have high prices or you have no growth. And this is a situation where we are right now in the US, in Latin America, and that's the reason why there is so much volatility and so much uncertainty around the world at this moment. Because you're, you're trapped in a dilemma. Either you have high prices or the economy doesn't grow. And so nobody has found the answer to that peculiar situation we are going through at this moment. So these are the major trends uh, for the uh, new world system, but we also have a new geopolitical setting at the same time. And this new political setting, geopolitical setting, is the question, are we in a new Cold War? Is this where we stand? And to answer that, there are a couple of issues that we have to look into. First is the rise of China. Uh, in 1949, the Chinese Communist Party uh, declared victory over Chiang Kai-shek and the Nationalist Party, who went over to Taiwan, and they began a socialist revolution that made a change in 1979, which is interesting because the Iranian Revolution was in 1979. In 1979, the same year, Deng Xiaoping came to power in China, and he changed the policy. Instead of rural socialism with Mao Zedong's policy, he wanted to modernize and transform China, right? And that's where modern China began with Deng Xiaoping in 1979. Uh, at this day, China is moving on with the new Silk Road initiative, right? China is building infrastructure uh, around Africa, around Asia, and they're moving on with this new Silk Road initiative. But at the same time, conflicts in its region, the maritime, conflict in the Pacific with the uh, 
South Sea, China South Sea, conflict with Japan, conflict with uh, Vietnam over territorial disputes. Then we have the NATO expansion. With the uh, end of the Cold War, many ask what will be the role of NATO? Because there's no communism, so we're not going to be in trouble with anyone around the world, right? But then, uh, but also with the, uh, the end of communism came the dissolution of the Warsaw Pact, which was a military alliance between the Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc countries, Hungary, uh, Bulgaria, uh, uh, Czechoslovakia, uh, Yugoslavia, all these countries were part of the Warsaw Pact. Now the Warsaw Pact disappeared. What is the need for having NATO? Well, NATO began an expansion. On the contrary, it began to expand. The Balkan states, Latvia, Libya, uh, uh, the Baltic states, the former Yugoslavia, all the new countries that were formed, Montenegro, Kosovo, uh, Serbia, all these countries then began to be part of NATO. But then you got the Russian Federation now. The Russian Federation as part of the 15 new states that were created. And here comes Vladimir Putin. And Vladimir Putin says that the uh, dissolution of the Soviet Union was the biggest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century. So he doesn't believe that Gorbachev did the right thing. Gorbachev was put in place to reform the system, not to bury the system, right? He was supposed to strengthen socialism in, in, in the Soviet Union, but it came the other way around. And so that's why Putin says that the dissolution, the disappearance of the Soviet Union was the major geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century. And then because that dissolution, there was a transition to market economy in Russia, but that did not do well. It was under the auspices of the IMF who imposed austerity measures. It didn't work out well. You had scarcity in, 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 in Russia. People were making lines to buy food. And for Russia, that was an empire, that was a humiliation. And so the Putin era has mean nationalism, a revival of nationalism, an anti-Western sentiment. Uh, and Russia is trying to be a persistent power. It doesn't have the economic means, but it has nuclear, uh, nuclear power. Russia foreign policy. What, what is exactly the Russian foreign policy nowadays? You have to distinguish between two. The near abroad. Who are the near abroad? Region of Russian of fundamental interest. Previous Soviet socialist republics, Georgia, um, Chechenia, uh, Moldavia, Belarus, all these previous socialist republics that are now independent countries but are geographically important to Russia because they, they are under Russian sphere of influence, right? But now NATO has been expanding towards those countries and uh, Russia is trying to resist that expansion of NATO into that part of the world. But at the same time that Russia is trying to limit the expansion of NATO, Russia is part of a strategic vision of creating what is called Eurasianism. And Eurasianism is something that the US will, not, will never allow. The reason is this, it's a geopolitical reason. If anyone ever has full control of the Eurasian area of the world, they will dominate the world. And that is an alliance between China, Russia, and India, controlling the Indo-Pacific Ocean. That represents a major geopolitical challenge to the US. And that's the, under, the hidden reason why NATO was trying to expand into Russian sphere of influence. Now, this is a major problem. Russia has had conflicts with Chechenia, two wars with Chechenia, a war in Georgia and in Moldova to prevent them coming into NATO and being part of the European Union. And of course now the war in Ukraine that began in 2014 with the annexation of Crimea and conflicts in the Donbass region, the eastern part of Ukraine where Russia claims that there is a, uh, a population that is of Russian origin. Now, the thing is that Ukraine is, it's, has its borders with Russia. If Ukraine is part of, the, of, of NATO, then the nuclear weapons held, held by the West would be near Moscow. And then the Russia is very much against that. And then there's 
a Russia-China relationship. Uh, and I would like to read it, what it says here. It's a, uh, an agreement they made between China and Russia. It says, the parties reaffirm their interest in building a greater Eurasian alliance together and in coordination with the construction of the Silk Road to promote the development of regional associations as well as bilateral ones and multilateral integration processes for the benefit of the peoples of the Eurasian continent. So we see that China and Russia are agreeing in creating a Eurasian, a Eurasian uh, system which will not be allowed by the West. We have emerging countries, the BRICS, right? Originally it was uh, Brazil, Russia, India, and South Africa. Now it has expanded. In the last meeting in Johannesburg in South Africa, it has expanded. Saudi Arabia and Iran, something unimaginable because Saudi Arabia and Iran never are at the same table. Sunnis and Shi'is uh, is conflict within the Islamic world, but now they're part of BRICS. And also uh, Egypt as Argentina, uh, Ethiopia, they have expanded the BRICS and it brings something that is very dear to my friend Ambassador Haine is the Global South. The Global South creating its own voice to participate in world affairs. And the idea of the new BRICS is partnership for mutually accelerated growth, sustainable development, and inclusive multilateralism. I cannot end my talk without saying something about Latin America, because the Dominican Republic is part of a larger picture, which is Latin America. I will be very brief about it. Latin America, as part of the Washington consensus, to the pink tide, right? We had neoliberal, began in Chile in the 70s, Increasing the price of commodities, we talked about that before, but for Latin America, it was beneficial because the region produces commodities. So when prices went up, all these countries had greater revenues and it were invested in infrastructure development projects. And all the presidents at that time were reelected. And when they entered the presidencies, high approval because they had income that no one ever had before and were invested in investment projects. I will say this, for example, in Chile, uh, the road from the airport to Santiago de Chile, they call it Shanhattan. And when I ask, why do you call this Shanhattan? It's a mixture of Shanghai and Manhattan. It's totally modernized, right? And all Latin America was the same. We in the Dominican Republic built an underground subway system. It couldn't have been possible before. So those years between 23 2003 and 2013 were the golden the golden age of economic development in Latin America. Nothing before has happened as it did with the high uh, prices, commodity prices that were enable us to make those huge investments and transform our countries. So the increase of commodities uh, allow enable the emergency, the emergence and rise of the progressive movement uh, all, all around Latin America. We talked about, we never really made it, regional integration is something still pending. Uh, then we had the economic and social crisis, the impact of the global financial crisis also uh, was very negative for the region. And then we have had changes in the political cycle. We look at it at this way. There is a trend how the global economy is now determining electoral political outcomes in our countries. That's, that's the new reality in Latin America. And then there's the new geopolitical competition, China and US, the unavoidable rivalry. Uh, and this is what the, this moment uh, holds the international agenda. As I said before, the Eurasian control strategy, that's the key issue looking into the future. We also have Iran and North Korea nuclear powers and being part of the contest taking on now. And of course, something that we see every day, the US becoming a dysfunctional democracy, right? Political polarization, social inequalities, and post-racial society to Black Lives Matter, crime, violence, drug trafficking, impact of COVID-19. The question is, is the US a power in decline, right? The Middle East, just two weeks ago, a new intifada, uh, the uh, terrorist attack by Hamas in Israel, which has been condemned by everyone who has a sensitivity for humankind, something that should be condemned because it was a terrorist attack. But uh, we also should look at the response, the Israeli response to, to Gaza. I think it's getting out of hand uh, and also civilians are being attacked. 
being attacked. I think the, the role being played by the UN making a call to halt the attacks and to search a way, find a way that we can have lasting peace in the Middle East, I think it's something that should be really considered because otherwise the conflict will escalate and then other powers in the region will jump in. Already there are clashes with Hezbollah in South uh, Lebanon, uh, attacks in, in, in the West Bank, attacks in Gaza. Uh, Iran is behind Hamas. So this can escalate into a large conflict that no one really wants at this point in history. So in ending, what is the future of globalization? Uh, first of all, there's an end of neoliberalism. Neoliberalism is dead. It's not accepted anywhere in the world now. Secondly, there's a talk about deglobalization. Uh, and by deglobalization is a movement towards a less connected world, characterized by powerful nation states, local solutions, border controls, rather than global institutions, treaties, and free movement. This is something that has been sustained by Chatham House up in the UK. Instead of hyperglobalization, it's more regionalization. So instead of going around the world, we're going to be divided by regions. Latin American region, the European region, Asian, uh, the Arab League, the African Union, so by regions. And then there's something new that is called nearshoring, friendly shoring. Companies, US companies in China, US companies in South Korea will be coming to the region. But they will not be coming to the US because still in the US, labor is expensive. Labor costs are expensive. They will be coming to our region in the Caribbean and Latin America. So Dominican Republic will be benefiting. Mexico will benefit. All these countries around of US companies, pharmaceutical companies, high tech companies, right, that will be coming to our place because we still have cheap labor and because there's a free trade agreement between Central America, Dominican Republic, and the United States. So what I can see is that our country, Dominican Republic, will be booming in the years to come because all these companies will be under U.S. sphere of influence and will be able to ship goods and services into the U.S. economy due to regionalization as a reaction of the rivalry between U.S., China, which is part of the current geopolitics. But there is also globalization 4.0. So people think globalization will continue, and that will be fighting populism, reducing inequalities, innovation-driven economy, new global norms, unprecedented pace of technological change that will be taking place. Technologies that will deal with uh, a new wave of artificial intelligence. The question is having social interactive robots that will displace humans. That's something to be seen. The Internet of Things extended reality, blockchain, 5G networks, quantum computing, biotech, and social interaction robotics. So in ending, what we have is a world in disarray, right? Fast-paced technological advances and a revival of traditional geopolitics. The solution, I think, lies in knowledge. If we can have or institutions like BU training a new generation, people more sensitive to world affairs, more aware, and as a consequence, more engaged, I'm absolutely sure that we'll have a better world. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, President Fernandez, for those illuminating thoughts and comments. Uh, we have some time for uh, questions now, and uh, there is a roving mic. I have plenty of questions myself, but I will hold them. Uh, try to make a question rather than an extensive commentary. Uh, and so end with the question mark, whatever you're saying, and try to be brief and to the point, so that more of you can have access to the mic. But the floor is open. Let us start with the student. Here. I have several of my students here. I hope they will raise their hand, or otherwise I will <laughs> call on them. Uh, Daniel. First of all, President, it's an honor to have you here. Thank you very much Thank you. for guest speaking for us. My question is towards the regional integration you were speaking about. Um, Colombia, um, Latin America, and therefore I recognize the importance of our regional integration in the region. 
what would you think would be probably the three main key points to follow for that integration to come through and be as important as the European Union, for example? We have been talking about regional integration for decades, and it never takes place. And the reason I believe is because we're, we're not being practical enough. Uh, I look at UNASUR, a previous organization, and they're organized in terms of different areas of development. So you have, I would say, a regional uh, ministry on education, a regional ministry on, on healthcare, a regional ministry on public works. If you can organize that that way, and you have continuous meetings among Latin American ministers on education, on healthcare, on climate change, that will be meaningful because policies will come out of that that will be implemented in each of the countries. But if you have a meeting like CELAC, CELAC is the current organization that represents integration at the market. You have a first meeting and you talk about having a common currency, it will go nowhere. Because in order to have a common currency, each of the countries will have to shut down their, their, their uh, uh, central banks. And there's not trust enough, still there's not enough trust in Latin America to eliminate my national peso dominicano and come up with a currency I don't know what it's going to be. Even in Europe, the euro, the establishment of the euro has been a process. And not everybody is in favor. That's why uh, the UK uh, left left the European Union through Brexit because they're not going to give up their currency and be under the control of the Germans. In order to make it happen, you need to combine fiscal policy with monetary policy, right? Fiscal policy, you have a national government that deals with fiscal policy, but then you will have a, a Latin American central bank that will deal with the monetary policy of the others. So when you have an inflation, what can I do? I will depend on that regional bank and I don't know what are the other interests. That doesn't work. So when I see that you convene a meeting just to say we're going to have a, a, a Latin American currency, I say this is going nowhere. But now if you call a meeting and you say we're going to have agreements between our universities and we're going to exchange scholars and we're going to exchange researchers and students, there's going to be student mobility. So a student in the Dominican Republic can go to Colombia and spend six months. Someone from Colombia can go to Mexico and when you finished your studies at the high education level, your diploma will be recognized and you can work in each of these places. That makes sense. And it's a step forward in creating integration. So I think, yes, we cannot imitate European Union. That's another reality. We cannot do that. But integration means exchange. It's not only trade, selling goods and services. It's many other things. Right? It's, it's culture. It's music. It's literature. It's everything that we can exchange if we have the means to organize it and make it happen. Right? Yes. Uh, I would like to recognize Ambassador Paul Hare, who is one of the co-organizers of this event as director of the Center for Latin American Studies. And I wonder if he has a question or a comment for President Fernandez. Thank you, President Fernandez, for coming to the EU. I actually have a, a kind of global question rather than Latin American question. Mm -hmm. Uh, you mentioned the move away from global institutions, regional concentrations, the BRICS and so on, Belt Road. Um, several of the major world leaders didn't even show up to the UN General Assembly in September. Um, my question is, can we save the United Nations and is it worth doing so? There is a proposal coming from the Global South uh, about the need to reform the UN because the UN, especially at the uh, Security Council, represents the victors of the Second World War. It does not take into account new actors that have come into the uh, global scene uh, that need to have a representation there. How can that be done? We don't know yet. There are, have been many proposals to reform the UN, from Kofi Annan to uh, Guterres at this moment. But uh, there's a lack of political will to move forward. That's, that's quite evident. You know? But also to give veto powers to new actors will be even worse. So they will kind of uh, uh, lower any major decision that can be taken at the Security Council uh, uh, at the UN. So there is a need for reform to recognize the value of new actors and to uh, be more efficient in many of the UN agencies dealing with uh, sustainable development and specifically with climate change at this moment. Right? 
So we all know that the only organization that has the convening power that the, that the UN has is, is only the UN. No one can make come together 180 countries. But there is a loss of interest if nothing concrete comes out of that. So everybody understands that there is a necessity uh, to establish reforms for the UN now coming into the third decade of the 21st century, an institution that still operates with a mindset of the end of the Second World War. I happened to be in New York uh, in the third week of September for the conference that President Fernandez put together the Global Forum. And it happens, this is organized together with the meeting of the UNGA of the United Nations General Assembly. And something quite fascinating happened. Only one of the leaders of the P5 countries, that is the permanent members of the UN Security Council, uh, attended that opening of the United Nations General Assembly. And that was, in fact, President Biden, who you know is the head of the host country. Uh, no other head of the P5 attended that. And I had been in New Delhi a few weeks earlier. And there, at the G20 meeting, three of the heads of the P5 attended. What does that tell us? The world is changing. And entities like the G20, like the BRICS, may command more attention, more interest than good old United Nations. Next question. Yes. Hi, President Fernandez. I want to thank you again for the absolute distinct honor of coming to Boston University. Thank you. Um, I know recently you started a new political party in 2019, which you've been the head of. I was wondering what some of your kind of aspirations and visions were to continue the Dominican Republic's success in this transformation into the digital age um, of a lot of reform and modernity and success that your country is having. Thank you. Well, <laughs> almost doing campaigning here, right? <laughs> well, uh, when I came into office, uh, in 1996, that was a long time ago. Some of you have not even born, You're not even born yet. Uh, my slogan, my campaign slogan was making the Dom Santo Domingo a little New York. Making of Santo Domingo a little New York. Hacer de Santo Domingo Nueva York Chiquito. Right? That was my dream. And I think we did some of that. Now, as uh, Ambassador Heine was explaining when he uh, was introducing me, the Dominican Republic has been going through stages of development. First, an agricultural export-oriented economy, now a service-oriented economy depending much on tourism and free trade zones. My dream would be, coming into office again, to create, an, uh, to create what we call a knowledge society for the Dominican Republic. And that knowledge society is a model of economic growth and, and, and sustainability of economic growth and development, sustainable development would be depending on the intensive use of technology to increase productivity and innovation through the use of high tech. If we can achieve that, the Dominican Republic could become the high tech hub of Central America and the Caribbean. And if I am able to accomplish that, I think everything I've done would have been uh, meaningful. And so that's the reason why I'm trying to run again I know it's an uphill battle, but we'll still have a chance. Thank you very much, President Fernandez. Here. If you can identify yourselves, please. Thank you very much. It's, it's an honor to have you back in Boston. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so there's a saying that says there are more uh, cell phones in the world than there are toothbrushes. Um, <laughs> and it, it's something true that I've seen with the organization I run. We bring people from the U.S to Dominican Republic and we connect with them on a grassroots level. And one of the things that we have experienced firsthand is the huge socioeconomic divide that exists within the communities. So I appreciate you uh, speaking about the importance of bringing knowledge, not only a knowledge society, but the knowledge economy. Um, and my question is, uh, how do you see big tech being part of your um, big organizations like Google um, that use content uh, as a way to connect people, but also to separate people. Right. I think, you know, the first thing you need in order to have an economic uh, uh, and knowledge society is to have the workforce. 
And so during my first administration, we created what is called the Santo Domingo Cyber Park. And the idea is to convert that cyber park into a high-tech corridor. We'll call it the high-tech corridor of the Americas. The workforce came with the creation of the uh, ITLA, which is the Technological Institute of the Americas. And we have graduated over 80,000 youngsters from that institution in connection with uh, high-tech institutes here in the U.S. Beginning, for example, in New Jersey, uh, there is an institute, I don't remember the name, it's a high-tech institute in New Jersey. We partner with them to train some of our students, but also uh, faculty coming from India, from Israel, from the U.K., from the U.S., South Korea, and Japan to train our students back in Dominican Republic in high-tech. So they're very knowledgeable in software development projects, uh, in biotech, nanotech, mechatronics. They build drones. Now, the idea is to expand that. And in order to achieve that, there will be a partnership between the Dominican Republic, Florida, which at this point is the fourth state in the U.S. in terms of technological development. They have over 100,000 uh, startup tech companies in Florida, but also in New York and eventually Boston, which is also a high-tech area. Two million Dominicans living in, in the States, young people, bilingual, bicultural, uh, graduating from U.S. colleges like yourself, with ex uh, working experience here using the U.S. standardized models. If we can bring all that brain power to the Dominican Republic, connecting with the companies, there will be a radical transformation, creating more wealth for the Dominican Republic, and through a fiscal policy distributing that wealth in terms of fairness and equality, which will finally end poverty in the Dominican Republic. Because at the end is ending poverty. How do we end poverty? By creating wealth. And you create wealth nowadays through high tech. You can see how companies, companies have create more wealth that income from any nation states in the world nowadays. So, and how, how, how has that been accomplished? Through high tech. Now, if you don't have appropriate fiscal policies in place that can make a fair di distribution of that wealth, you have done nothing, you have accomplished nothing. But if you can combine increasing through productivity and innovation with intensive use of technology, well, you will really transform a nation by doing that. Very good. Thank yes, you. there. Good afternoon, President. Thank you very much uh, again for coming. My name is Alexander, and I'm with the Atlantic Council Cyber State Craft Initiative. Um, one of the things that you talked about uh, extensively there, you touched on briefly in your last answer, was the development of, of um, San Domingo and the Dominican Republic at large as a um, uh, sort of a cyber hub or, or, yes. or a big tech hub. And also what we're seeing in, in the Latin American region at the moment is especially with the development of 5G networks there through uh, Huawei and ZTE. And there is increasing Chinese investment in the area uh, when it comes to, to cyber and tech. Um, I mean, the, the US has their Bureau of Cyberspace and uh, Digital Policy. Uh, they have the OAS. They have uh, the EU has two now um, separate cyber uh, groups that are dedicated to working within Latin America, lac 4 and, and cyber for dev um, what can the region do to really harness this, um, you know, uh, this, this sort of uh, you know, geopolitical battle that is going on within the region to, to be able to get the most benefit out of it um, between, you know, the, essentially uh, the West and, and China competing for, uh, for places like the Dominican Republic's interest? You know, uh, Latin America as a region, as a whole, as a whole region, is divided into, into different uh, areas. You will have South America, as you pointed out, more linked to China. But then Central America, Mexico, and the Caribbean is more related to the US. So in our case, thinking about a cyber hub will be necessarily with the US because there are restrictions within the Caribbean to have Chinese investments, especially in high tech. For example, there is uh, a plan uh, towards Huawei uh, to penetrate Dominican markets. So uh, in our case, looking at it strategically, we have a, a large Dominican population already in the US, people trained in high-tech fields, uh, going back and forth to the Dominican Republic, 
Well, our, our bet will be with the US. We are under US sphere of influence, geographical proximity, uh, large Dominican population. What else? I mean, we have to do it with the US. Uh, there's no competition for us. It has to be with the US, and we prefer doing it with the US, as a matter of fact. For many reasons, China is far away, US is right there, an hour 45 minutes flight from Santo Domingo to Miami. Uh, it's closer, Miami, Santo Domingo, and Santo Domingo to Monte Cristi, right? So it's part of us. Uh, but I, I was always thinking about training the people who would do that. And already with 60,000 only from the Technological Institute of the Americas, the best train in the Dominican Republic, because they have this global scope. They, ha they have received instructions from people coming from different parts of the world. Uh, it's just making the attraction of uh, US companies coming. You know, we need flagships. We need to have Microsoft. We need to have Hewlett Packard to come into the DR and make it visible. I remember during my first administration that we uh, made a trip to Silicon Valley. We were coming from South Korea and we stopped in San Francisco and visited the Silicon Valley. Well, we were there, the delegation was, was at the gift shop at Microsoft. We find a baseball cap. It says, made in the Dominican Republic. Well, this is interesting. <laughs> we never knew that I can come to Silicon Valley and see a Dominican product over here. <laughs> it is good, but it's not enough. I would like to come next time and continue to see the baseball cap say made in the Dominican Republic. But I would like to see a software program that says made in the Dominican Republic. Why? Because it will be added value to a product manufactured in the Dominican Republic. And there's added value, there's added wealth. And there's added wealth, there's the resources to confront the major problem, poverty. Very good. There are some questions here on this slide. It's been a bit silent until now. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, my name is Albert, as you know me, Albert Cuevas. Yes, of course. I'm Dominican. I was raised and born, born in the Dominican Republic. Um, I came to the U.S. and graduated from Westfield State University. It's in Western Mass, uh, Springfield area. My question is, President, and back in 2008, uh, the Cumbre de Rio, the 20th Cumbre de Rio was celebrated in Dominican, and you were the host over there uh, in, in the conflict between Ecuador, Colombia, and Venezuela. So you were a huge mediator that stopped the conflict between those countries, right? So right now the conflict between Israel and Palestine is a, is a huge um, event, as everybody knows, that could be, could be solved in a better way by the U.S. You think U.S. did uh, well um, supporting Israel, or they should um, be more like a, serve as a mediator in that conflict? Small question. Yeah. <laughs> I would have hoped you would ask that to President Biden. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I could have contributed to solve the conflict between Ecuador, Colombia, and Venezuela because I had a personal friendship with those presidents. I was a friend of Hugo Chavez, I was a friend of Alvaro Uribe, and I was a friend of Correa. I was a friend of all of them. So they trusted me to find a way to solve that conflict. If I would have been inclined in favor of Chavez, I would not be entrusted with the possibility of solving that conflict. They would have to think about someone neutral, someone they could trust. I think, of course, the Palestinian-Israeli problem is much deeper than that. Many years, right? And uh, there are many beliefs. Uh, we're talking about religious places that is very deep. Uh, to many of the people there from the Israeli side, from the Christian side, from the Muslim side. Because if you travel to the place and you visit Israel and say, is this what they're fighting for? I mean, this is a small piece of land. And is this what they're fighting for? But it's more than that. They're fighting for their religious beliefs. They're fighting for biblical um, promises. This is, you know, this is the promised land. This is, this is the chosen one. And so it has a major effect on them. Of course, there needs to be a peaceful solution to that. There needs to be a peaceful solution to that. And from my point of view, from my humble perspective, the only solution is, first of all, Israel needs to guarantee, a guarantee that it can live safely there, that its citizens can live with safety there. They need that guarantee. But there's also a guarantee to the Palestinians that they must have an independent country, an independent state. 
And until you don't get this together, it's very difficult. I had the privilege of speaking at one point with uh, the King Abdullah of Jordan. And he said to me, you know, the biggest problem that we have in the region and will always be a huge problem is the Arab-Israeli-Palestinian-Israeli problem. We have to solve that. He told me this over 15 years ago. And look, today is the main problem. Uh, I asked Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu in an official state visit, Prime Minister, Mr. Prime Minister, why can't we solve, why can't you solve the problem with the Palestinians? He says, it's very easy. What do you mean? He says, the only thing we need that they recognize the Israel state as a Jewish state. Is that all? Yes, we need a recognition that Israel is the Jewish state of Israel. So that's the point. You go back to religion. You go back to religious faith. For Israel is important because if, if the Palestinians recognize Israel as a Jewish state, that means that they comply with all the beliefs coming from the biblical, biblical text. That Israel is the promised land by Jehovah. God, to the chosen country, to the chosen one, which is Israel. That means a lot. So the Palestinians will never say the, the Jewish state of Israel. They will never say that. And that's what Israel is expecting from them. And the Palestinians are expecting from Israel that they recognize the two-state solution. Israel is a state. Palestine is another state. Even though in terms of territory, it's fragmented. You have the West Bank one side and you have Gaza on the other side they're not together right so it's a very complex geopolitical situation but we'll need necessarily a solution because it is not only an Israeli Palestinian problem it becomes a regional problem and it might become a world problem why well because Iran is supporting the Palestinians right Hezbollah in Lebanon is supporting the Palestinians. There are already clashes between Israelis and, and Hezbollah. But then Iran is looking. The U.S. is already moving a fleet to the region. Turkey is moving ships to the region. You never know what can happen. right? And all of a sudden, something that began as a targeted terrorist attack becomes a global confrontation. So there is a need to have, I would say, a visionary leadership committed to peace that can come together and find a definitive solution. You do nothing, as happened during the Trump administration, to support Israel in translating, uh, translating its uh, capital from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. The UN indicated that Jerusalem is an international city. It's the capital of the Jews, the capital of the Christians, and the capital for the Muslims. So what you do is you irritate you irritate one side of the conflict. You have to be fair, you have to be open yeah, and find a solution to each one. How can they coexist? How can they live together, even though having different different faiths and different, different ways of looking at, at global affairs? You have Arabs, Arabs, Israelis living within Israel. That's another situation. Arabs that are Israeli, that uh, they have the nationality, they're Israelis. Right? So let's hope and pray and see if understanding, reason takes place and you can overcome the situation. At some yeah. point, it has to be. Okay. Thank you. Here, Danilo. Hi, President Fernandez. I was wondering to what extent you find nearshoring to be a challenge for uh, moving the Dominican Republic toward a more technology-based economy, right? and its focus on low scale labor. For the Dominican Republic, it will be an opportunity a great opportunity if we have near shoring because it will be American companies at a different level not only will be the garment industry it's not only textiles and apparel and footwear and plastics and medical equipment it's pharmaceuticals is is, is high-tech all these companies coming all of a sudden I think uh, it will transform it will speed up the transformation of the Dominican Republic the challenge I think it's quite clear here in the US that you cannot depend everything countries that are far away and in which you might have a rivalry. 90% of aspirants that U.S. citizens consume is produced in China. 
they cannot be allowed anymore. I mean, even even yeah, even yeah. aspirins. Huh? You, have cannot, to get healthy. you have to get healthy. <laughs> well, that's the first thing. But we always, at some point, uh, at some point, we get sick. Now, all these medical stuff cannot be produced in China. If he, if China is going to be your rival, the health of your citizens cannot depend on the capacity of production of your rival. You have to be coming first of all closer to U.S. shore, closer, and uh, economically feasible for U.S. companies, right? But uh, within the sphere of influence of the United States. So there will be, in the next 10 years, a major shift in those companies moving from Asia into our region. And for the Dominican Republic, if this happens, it couldn't have been better. Very good. Well, I have many questions myself, and I'm sure many of you have many <laughs> additional questions, but we have run out of time. So I would like you to uh, join me in thanking uh, President Fernandez for this extraordinary <laughs>